Yeah! All right, it's happening. What's up, everybody? All right, it's over. All right. That was the right amount of energy for this venue. You know? You don't, you don't, you don't want it to be too loud. You're going to alert the authorities. I love this. This is my first time at uh, Soul Joel's, and, and uh, this feels temporary. I don't, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I have another show tomorrow night, but if I showed up and this room is empty, I wouldn't be shocked. <laughs> I mean, how quickly could you leave? You're just, a, an ex <laughs> just a utility knife and we're out of here. I love this. It'd be so funny if we found out like they've just been squatting in this space. <laughs> you showed up and there's just like a handwritten sign, comedy that way. <laughs> Do they know what's going on? <laughs> Just like elderly people over there listening to big band music and they're like, what's happening to the left? Don't worry about that, Grandpa. It's good, man. It's my first time in, uh, in Pottstown and uh, yeah, I didn't know what to expect. No, it's not Pottsville. I, uh, but <laughs> that's true. Yeah, you were the one that let me know. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> So after I got this booking, I made the event on Facebook and I just put in Pottsville. Because in my head, I was like, what? yeah, Pottsville. And it's not, it's Pottstown. And she let me know Pottsville is also a real place. <laughs> and it's not near here, obviously, because a war would have broken out. <laughs> you guys had to move that near Pittsburgh or something. Can't have Pottstown next to Pottsville. That would be... <laughs> It'll be a war, you know? <laughs> Thankfully, you let me know, and I'm like, thank God, there we go. Yeah. I could totally see this setup also in Pottsville, though. I don't... <laughs> taking a guess, you know? <laughs> I'm just throwing darts, and... <laughs> I, I feel like it, you know? But, uh, yeah, I landed in Philly this morning, and drove up, and uh, it was crazy. Like, as soon as Pottstown came into view, it was just those big... It looked like I was coming into Springfield. Or something. Just, those, just those two, like, is that a nuclear power plant out there? Man. It really let me know the type of people I was about to encounter. Because I've met a couple Homer Simpsons since I've been here. Just a couple people where I'm like, mm, you don't know what today is, do you? And I'm not knocking on Pottstown. It's very nice, but uh, the people, the, I've met three people, all right? So this is not an indictment on your town. I'm probably wrong, okay? I haven't slept. I was on a red-eye flight, so it might be me. I hope it's me, all right? But I went to Walmart, and I went to, yeah. I started at Walmart, and I went to self-checkout, and the lady running the self-checkout said, good morning, too long. I don't even know if that makes sense to you, but I just walked in and she, it was too loud and too long and she didn't break eye contact. It was just, good morning! And I, I haven't slept all night. I got off a flight and then drove an hour to Springfield and now I'm at this, now I'm at this Walmart and I'm like, hi, yeah, good morning. And then she just... As I walked over to self-checkout and I'm like... Duly noted, you know? <laughs> And then I went over to the hotel to check in. There's a little girl working the counter. Hello! And you're like, again? <laughs> Damn it, you know? It's just hard. <laughs> it makes me wonder if it's me. I think it's probably me, you know? But it might be them. <laughs> it makes me wonder. There's just a feeling in, there's a, a creepy feeling in this town. <laughs> I can't put my finger on it, and I'm sure it's just me, but there's just a Quaker Oats man feeling about this town. Like, every person I've met just has a look on their face, like, oh no, an outsider. Smile till he leaves. And I, I'm probably wrong. I think it's just all the war. There's been too many wars on this land, and you can feel it. You can feel it in your heart. The revolutionary, probably the civil, you know. Uh, January 6th, I feel like something happened here. It feels like there's been a lot of wars on these fields out here. 
and I can just feel the tension in my heart a little bit. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but I think I'm safe. I think I'm safe. We're inside, man. This beautiful Sunny Brook uh, community. Uh, it's very cool. I like it. I'm very happy to be here. I, uh, I actually just moved to New York City. Um, yeah, brand new to New York City. I didn't expect you to clap at that. <laughs> nobody has. Nobody has. Nobody has. I've told so many people, and they've just stared at me like I said Pottsville when I met Pottstown. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm excited to be there. Yeah, I'm totally. Thank you so much. <laughs> I was, I was super pumped. I told everybody, because I, I grew up in San Diego, and I'm like, we're moving to New York City, and everyone was just like, why? Why would you do that? And I'm like, I've always wanted to live in the big city. And no, I grew up in the trailer park, in, in the suburbs of San Diego. I'm used to small, smaller town feel, you know, and I want to be in the big city on the thing, you know? I want to fit in with the locals in the big city. And uh, so that's what I've been trying to do. We've lived there for all of a week. And uh, I had to fly back to do a show. That's why I had a red eye flight last night, just so you know that what's going on in my life. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm trying to adjust to the city because I, I don't fit the vibe there. Like, for instance, I smile too much. Uh, like, too much. And that's not a, you shouldn't be too joyful in New York City. <laughs> Like, I live in uh, Park Slope, Brooklyn, and, and everyone, all my neighbors just kind of have a, a look on them, like, a, like an author that can't finish their novel. Just, does that make any sense? Like, they just, it's like a perplexed anger on their face, where they're just walking around, uh, how do I kill the protagonist? Like, just, I can, I can see that's what's going on in their heads. And, uh, you know, and I smile too much, so I gotta, I gotta work on the smile, you know? You can't smile. You, can't be like that all the time. And I make eye contact. Can't make eye contact, you know? It's good for comedy. It's good to be on stage to make eye contact with your audience, let them know you're engaged and present. Uh, but it's not good on the subway. <laughs> yeah, just sitting there, just... That'll get you killed, you know? So I'm trying to temper that. I'm trying to keep that in my heart, you know? Even though it's in there, I'm like, <laughs> we're really doing it. <laughs> I get so excited on the subway, because I've always had a car, and now I don't have a car, and I'm just on the big train, and I'm like... <laughs> I feel like, babe, pig in the city, you know? Just a lot of excitement going through my heart. That's a creaky stage right there. <laughs> Did you hear that? I just went... Rrr. Wow. Okay, we'll stay on this side. <laughs> this stage is actually more solid than what it looked like from down there. Like, when I was in the back of the room, I'm like, that looks like a temporary stage. And then I came up here, I'm like, no, these are barn doors or something. <laughs> I'm like, that. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I've been in New York for a week, and it's been fun. We went and saw the movies, we went to the cinema, which is cool, like some hipster cinema where they serve you cocktails. And then you're like, oh, this is fun, and then you find out they're $20. And you're like, oh, no, this costs more than the movie. And so that part's kind of a bummer. But we went and watched the movie Air. Have you guys watched that one yet? The Nike movie. It's about, them, it's about Nike signing Michael Jordan in 1984. You watched it? Oh, you haven't watched it. You just know of the story. I appreciate that. All right. I was trying to connect with someone like it. Did you watch it? You enjoyed it? I've not watched it yet. Nobody's watched this movie. <laughs> Right? These jokes should land. Uh, <laughs> these jokes should land pretty good right now. <laughs> I went and watched it, and it's a period piece. Like, as soon as the movie starts, it says 1984. So you know we're in 1984. But I don't know if you guys have noticed, every time there's a movie from, like, the 80s or 90s or even the 70s, they just feel like the constant need to let you know what year it is. Like, after every scene, they would just do a close-up of something from the 80s. Like, hey, remember Pop-Tarts? Oh, breakfast cereal. Oh, stupid pants. Remember that? And it was just like, after like 15 minutes, I turned to Emma, and I'm like, I get it. It's 1984. Like, let it go, you know? Like, they don't do that with other movies, like in the 1800s, just some guy churning butter. Like, yeah! Remember churning butter? Huh? Some guy sharpening a razor blade on a belt. Yeah, you know? God, the good old days, sharpening a razor blade on a belt. <laughs> but yeah, the whole movie was about, it was hard to root for Nike, because Nike wasn't struggling. They were doing great. They were a multi-million dollar business, maybe billion, who knows. It was just their basketball department was struggling. 
And one guy's like, I'm gonna lose my job. I gotta sign Michael Jordan. And it's weird, like, rooting for him, because you know it's gonna work out. <laughs> like, I already know how this goes. I'm like, you're wasting a lot of time stressing, man. You're gonna get him. <laughs> you need to relax. You need to find a good work-life balance, man. He's gonna, you're gonna get him. It's gonna be good. Essentially, what the movie is, is a company uh, trying to land an influencer. That's what it is. They were trying to land Michael Jordan, who would become the biggest influencer. But that let me know, the movie was good, by the way, but that let me know that in 20 years, this remake of this movie is gonna be lame, you know? <laughs> it's gonna be lame. It's just gonna be a corporation trying to land someone from social media, you know? Just some chubby executive running down the hallway going, we gotta get her, she's got the biggest ass on Instagram. <laughs> 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 the Maybelline story. <laughs> Are we gonna have to go? <laughs> I hope they get her. <laughs> I like that. You know, for not watching the movie, that's about as much as I can expect from you guys. It's, you know, we took a swing at it. What can we do? I don't know. <laughs> That's nice. I, uh, it's been good in New York. Uh, we, uh, we had a yard sale in, in San Diego before we moved. And uh, no, not my idea. I don't think a yard sale has ever been a man's idea in the history of yard sales. I don't think a man ever was like, hey, we go to a Saturday. You want to spend it in the front yard <laughs> with all of our things, meeting people we would never talk to in our regular lives at all? Would you like to do that? Would you like to haggle with a stranger over a Bluetooth speaker? Would you like to have that conversation of, no, that's not the original power charger. No, that's just one that happened to fit. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty sure that's a woman's idea every time. It was my, my lady's idea. Emma's like, hey, this weekend, let's have a yard sale. And, and, and I was like, yeah, we could also just burn it. <laughs> just also burn everything and start completely over. But it's like, no, we might make $400. We have to do this. And we put all our stuff out there. And we're out there at 5 a.m. We started too early, you know, because we're like, what if we're not ready by 8? What if, what if they leave us a bad Yelp review on our yard sale? <laughs> and then they show up at eight and it's a, uh, man, there's two types of people that come to yard sales. There's regular people and psychopaths, all right? <laughs> and the psychopaths are professional yard sale people who you don't expect to show up. You know, you just think you're gonna meet your neighbor from across the street who needs a lamp and you're like, I happen to have one right there. And then you high five and they leave and you're like, okay, we sold that lamp. But it's not, these are like serious yard sale people. Like they showed up at 7.50 and they're like, yeah, are you open? And I'm like, it's a front yard, dude. Like, <laughs> just come in. I don't, you know, <laughs> just start looking around. And that's the other part of the yard sale they don't talk about. Like we put all our stuff out there and I, it's not our best stuff, okay? <laughs> our best stuff we're keeping, okay? <laughs> This is stuff we're willing to part with. And I was looking at it going, I don't want the neighbors to see this. <laughs> They're gonna come in and go, this is the kind of crap they've been keeping in their house? I felt so self-conscious. The first couple people that came in, I'm like, we got better stuff inside. <laughs> but we're keeping that. We rummage around this garbage. <laughs> We had someone steal. We had someone steal at our yard sale. Emma and I saw a lady steal something at our yard. It was such a weird feeling. It was so weird because part of me was angry because you're stealing from me in my own yard. Like part of me wants to run up to you and kick your ass, you know? But there's another part of me that wants to run up to you and go, hey, thank you. <laughs> you could grab a couple more things on your way out. You can steal that, but you also got to take that giant thing and a couple of those, you know? I wasn't ready for the haggling. People haggled. I've never haggled a day in my life. I've never, I didn't know prices were negotiable. You know, this isn't, this isn't a flea market. You know, it was my front yard. My front yard, we put out our good blankets to lay this crap on. And they come in, will you? <laughs> Like, I've never haggled. And you know why I've never haggled? Because I grew up poor. And I don't know if anyone else feels this way, but like I do. Like, because I grew up poor, I always assume that people think I don't have it. So I'll go, I'll pay you double. You know, like I, I have that. I don't know if anyone can relate to that, but I have a little of that in me. What do you think, I'm trash? I'll pay you three times the amount. I'll buy your whole yard. You tell me right now. So I got that in me, so I would never haggle with somebody. But I remember uh, we had 
it was at one, we called it. We're like, all right, that's it. And whatever was left, we left in the yard. And we went and had lunch at a cafe down the street. And while we were eating there, someone came to a ring doorbell. And, you know, you can talk through the ring doorbell. There's a camera. And Emma answered it, and it was some lady. And she's like, is the rug still for sale? And she's pointing at the rug. And Emma's like, yeah. And she's like, is it still $10? I brought cash. And Emma's like, yeah. And she goes, will you take eight? And I'm like, are we negotiating through a ring doorbell right now? What are you doing with that $2? That's what I want to know. Like, what? Like, how do you just give me eight and slip it under my doormat? You just go home going, hey, she asked. Like, you already know that's a conversation she's having with her husband when she gets home. They asked for 10, but I said, I'll do eight. That's my bottom dollar. And then they said, well, okay, so I really stole this for us. You could have had it for free if you didn't just hit the doorbell. You know what I mean? Like, you could have just had it. What are you getting at? I'm worried about where that $2 is going. Going to like the Republic of China or something like they're, they're, they're funding something nefarious with those two dollars. That's what it was, man. But it was fun. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we finally got the move going. Uh, we, we live in a, I have a super at my building. I've never had a super before. And that's a superintendent. That's what that is. And he's a man I cannot understand. I don't, I don't even know what his native language is, but he is so unintelligible that even if I spoke his native language, I don't think it would help. It's that bad. Like, he speaks English, but it's so, I don't understand it, but what, I, what he makes up for not being able to be understood, he makes up for in volume and not, not letting you talk. So, I remember the first time I had to call him before because we're flying in and I'm like, we need to coordinate the key drop off because I'm coming in with eight pieces of luggage, two cats and a wife, you know, I'm bringing in a lot of stuff. And I'm like, hi, Kenny, his name's Kenny. And I'm, I don't think that's his name. <laughs> like, I think if we, I think if I asked his mother and he would be like, is Kenny around? She wouldn't know who I was talking about. And I was like, and I can't, here's the thing too, like he is so ununderstandable that my impression of him is as close as I can get, okay? Like it's not gonna make sense to you, but it's as close as I can get. I got on the phone, I'm like, hey Kenny, this is Zoltan. And he just goes, ah! That's as close as I can get to what I heard coming out of the phone. And I was like, Kenny, ah! Never mind. And I hung up the phone and Emma and I looked at each other. I'm like, did you hear that? And she's like, I didn't want to when I did. That wasn't even on speakerphone. That was off regular. Ah! And I was like, well, maybe he's easier to understand in person, you know, because I can read his lips, you know, I can go off the lips and then what he's saying. And it was, it was in per. Ah! And I'm like, this, okay, I'm responsible for what goes on up there is what I'm gathering. <laughs> If there's a clogged drain, that's on the Z-Man, because uh, I don't know if I can pantomime this problem to old Kenny here. <laughs> it's wild, dude. But it's good. I, uh, you know, I'm happy. I, uh, we got married uh, April 5th at the courthouse. That's why I'm rocking in the ring. Yeah. We had a... We had a courthouse. We're having a real wedding in, in Italy. We're flying to Italy in May. Yeah, we're eloping to Italy. And elopement, if you don't know, that's when you, uh, when you realize your, your wedding will be way more fun if nobody comes to it. <laughs> that's, where, that's, that's when you crunch the numbers and you're like, hey, if nobody comes, we can go to Italy, you know? <laughs> and that's when we weighed the love of our family against a trip to Italy and we decided au revoir, you know? <laughs> That's not even Italian, but it doesn't matter because they're not coming anyway, you know? So, but, but before we went to Italy, we had to, you know, we got married for realsies, like with the documentations at a courthouse in San Diego because I didn't want an Italian marriage license that I can't read. Uh, so I wanted one in English, so we had it over there. My mom came and she just sobbed at the courthouse, which moms just cry, that's what they do. And it was so weird because Emma and I were reading our, like, the, you know, we're saying our I do's, and she's crying, and we were like, I was like, are you, 
I'm like, I got nothing. Do you have? And I'm like, I got a little because my mother's crying, but I'm like, are you good? And she's like, I feel nothing right now. <laughs> and I'm like, I know, right? It's hard. It's hard to feel the emotion at the courthouse because the marriage license area is next to the death certificate desk. <laughs> And it's just, because you're just thinking of the mortality now. You're like, man, we're, if one of us goes two feet that way is where we get that frame document. Which, what is that for? What are you doing with the death certificate? You frame that? What do you do? You take it to the bank. You take it to the bank? Oh, so, oh, so you can get the person's money? Ah, that's so more, wow. Wow, we really... We really figured out what life was about all along, didn't we? Just going to the courthouse going, can I have a stamp document? I gotta take my dead relative's money. <laughs> you need multiple copies. You need multiple copies? Why do you all know this? Like, what? <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing, like, you don't do that day one. Yeah, you, you don't do that day one. Like, you know, you don't go right after the funeral going, I gotta go get the day, you know? There's, there's probably a couple days, right? You gotta be like, you gotta, that's, the, yeah, yeah, you know? That's probably something you, I've, thankfully, knock on wood, I've never, I haven't lost a you know, close, close relative yet to where I have to go get the death certificate. But I think that would cross my mind where I can't go get the document the next day. You know, you can't, you'd be like, when was the death? Uh, six hours ago. I really, I need this money, all right? Like, you got to give it a couple, you know, bereavement weeks. And then you're like, is this still good? You know? I, don't, I don't know if I'm sure. I'm just like, it's like I, feel, I always feel like I'm going to be judged by somebody. So I'm like, I got to give this a breath. You know. But yeah, afterwards we went out to a little uh, post-wedding uh, lunch with my mother. And my mother is a sweet lady. She's a sweet little Hungarian lady. She's really open-minded and all that stuff. But she's still uh, 60. So she's open-minded <laughs> with a cap. You know what I mean? Like, she's open. Everyone should live their lives. But, you know, that's her. Which I've never under... I, like, I've tried to figure out, of, like, what's that part? And she's like, what do you mean? Like, I remember uh, I had two friends... They were lesbians, and I remember before we met them, I was like, oh yeah, that's, uh, that's Casey, and that's her wife, uh, Kelly. Uh, they're lesbians. And then my mother was like, oh, that's okay. This is America. You're allowed to love whoever you want, but you know. <laughs> and I was like, what's that? What's that last part? And she's, and she's like, what do you mean? This is America. Everybody gets to be who they want, but you know. <laughs> And I'm like, I think, I think that's as open-minded as you can be for being born in 1963. And I respect her for at least doing that, you know? I'm not judging her. I'm just like, all right, that's where it is. I'll have my version of that if I'm ever lucky enough to be 60, you know? I'll have whatever that is. But I remember we went out to uh, eat, and our waiter had dreadlocks. And I could see my mom eyeballing these dreadlocks. And I'm like, don't, 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 come on, just don't. And she goes, oh, I love your hair. Can I touch your hair? <laughs> and I'm like, part of me was like, mom, you can. But then the other part of me was like, mm, he's white. <laughs> it was, there was a part, and then I'm like, no, this is okay. I actually think if you're a white dude with dreadlocks, there shouldn't even, no one should even have to ask. Like that's, that's the punishment for appropriating someone else's culture. <laughs> is that strange six-year-old women are gonna come up and just do this. I think that's how we kind of level that playing field a little bit, you know? <laughs> She's a sweetheart, I love my mom. She taught me everything I know about finances, which is why I don't own anything. <laughs> I was raised by a tiny Hungarian lady. And here's the thing, I've met a lot of Hungarians performing around the country. I have Hungarian people come to my shows just because my name is Zoltan Kassis on the marquee, and they're like, that guy's Hungarian, we gotta go, you know? And is that a person right there? That's the reason you came? My uh, ex-husband was Hungarian, and my kids are half Hungarian. All right, nice, all right. So this didn't come as like a vendetta uh, or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, gotta, so I gotta see one of his countrymen, you know? I'm kidding. I... <laughs> 
But yeah, so I get to meet a lot of Hungarians traveling around the country, and most of the Hungarians that I get to meet, their lineage started here in 56, because in 1956 there was a revolution in Hungary against communism, and uh, it didn't work, they lost. And it lasted like a week, so everybody that, that didn't want that, they like escaped and came to the United States. So most of the Hungarians I meet here came in 56. We came in 91, after communism fell, because my mom was kind of a communist. Uh, <laughs> And I mean like a real one, like a real one, not the modern definition of a communist where like you wore a mask during the pandemic. I don't mean that. <laughs> That's like the modern definition of a communist. I mean like a real one where she's like, I don't think people should own property. You know, like a real, she's one of those and see, it just got quieter. <laughs> I'm not, I don't agree with her, just for the record. <laughs> But that's who she is, and that's who I learned my finances from. Because <laughs> I, you know, I've started making a little bit of money in comedy, and I'm like, I, Mom, I've heard I'm supposed to invest this money and, and do stuff. She goes, what, are you an idiot? <laughs> you don't invest, why? So the bank can take it? And I was like, what do you mean? And she goes, no, that's not what you do with your money. And I was like, what do I do with my money? She goes, you put it in the bank. And I go, then what do I do? Then you look at it. <laughs> and then what do I do? Then you go to sleep. <laughs> so that's what I do. Before I go to bed, I look at my bank account and I go... <laughs> and, that's the, and that, by the way, if you talk to like any financial advisor, the worst, don't listen to my mother. <laughs> she has a lot of power over me, so I'm like, that's what, that's what we gotta do, you know? That's what we gotta do. It's hard. It's hard. We're doing our best out there. We're all living. Excited to be married. I'm, I'm, you know, I've realized that when we were in New York, what marriage, uh, uh, my favorite part of marriage is showing interest in each other's interests. You know what I mean? Like, we were walking around Prospect Park, and the uh, cherry blossom trees were blooming. And if I was single, I would have never known that. I would have just walked by that tree like an idiot and not taken time to admire it. But thankfully, I'm married, and my wife is like, the cherry blossom trees are blooming. Take a picture of that. And I'm like, whoa, I almost missed that. Hell yeah. And then she told me, do you know cherry blossom trees only bloom for two weeks a year, and then they die for the rest of the year? Don't miss that. And I'm like, man, there's so many dumb single guys just walking by it and missing the cherry blossom trees. What a bunch of losers, you know? And that let me, you know, because I know a little bit about her interests, and then because we're together, she knows that uh, pro wrestler Kurt Angle has been addicted to pain pills because he broke his neck at a 2003 pay-per-view called No Way Out. <laughs> And that's what marriage is. She knows a little bit about my interests, and I know a little bit about hers. <laughs> I'm glad you guys connected with that. I was, I was scanning this audience, and I'm like, I feel like they'd like that joke. <laughs> Kurt Angle's a Pennsylvanian, you know? Hey, thank you so much for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you liked it, shared it, subscribed to it, hit the notification bell, do all the things YouTube makes you want to do. Uh, other than that, I wanted to let you know that I'm constantly on tour, so go to my website, ZoltanComedy.com, and see if I'm coming to a town near you. Thank you kindly.